One of the men then forced Gavin to call his mother, Julie, and tell her some of his friends were coming round to pick something up. Otis and Christopher then drove to the house and pulled up in the drive. As soon as Julie opened the door, the men ambushed her and searched the house for valuables and money. As soon as they were done, they forced Julie into the boot of the car before covering her with a duvet and shutting her in. They then drove back to the farm and left her in the boot whilst they headed inside. This is Red Rum, a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Brian Waters. This episode contains detail of extreme torture and listener discretion is advised. The small hamlet of Stapley, just southeast of the market town of Nantwich, was home to around 2,500 people. Stapley is a predominantly rural area, so a lot of the land is taken up by farms and for agricultural usage. In early 2003, the hamlet was home to a wildlife hospital, a water garden, a garden centre and even a small zoo called the Palms Tropical Oasis. By all accounts, the area was a place for hard-working pensioners to go to spend their retirement years, and nearby Nutsford also housed a number of farms and farmhouses, one of which, Burnt House Farm, was being rented by Brian Waters. Brian was a 44-year-old married father of two adult children, 21-year-old Natalie and her older brother, 25-year-old Gavin. The family house was situated just a few miles away from the rented farmhouse. Living in the rustic hamlet and travelling to the nearby rural burnt farmhouse felt like a home from home for Brian. He had previously lived in the blissful town of Wrexham, often walking the stone-bricked roads leading to long winding rivers and cosy cottages attached to farmhouses. Behind closed doors, everything looked to be quite ordinary and certainly idyllic in the little hamlet of Stapley, but just up the road from the Waters family house, down a windy village road, and behind two creaky stable doors, Brian was making a living from manufacturing cannabis. He was growing the plant with lifelong friend and business partner Mujahid. The farmhouse was the perfect cover, and drug manufacturing wasn't suspected. Cannabis was completely illegal in the UK at this time. Knowledge of the manufacturing of cannabis in this little countryside farmhouse was not common, but there were a number of people who, for business reasons, did know about Brian's drug dealing and manufacturing. It was his main source of income, and he would often travel overseas to allow money to change hands and drugs to be dealt. Brian's main goal in life was to provide for and support his family, and for the majority of Natalie and Gavin's childhood and teenage years, he managed to do just that. Although his main source of income through these years is thought to have been from dealing Class B drugs. In the late 1990s, cannabis was a Class B drug, but in 2003, relaxation of cannabis laws came into effect, at least for a few years, in the United Kingdom. During this time, It's likely the demand for cannabis grew, and the likelihood of prison time, especially for small amounts, was less likely. So, the cannabis manufacturing grew for Brian. Just four years earlier, Brian had been stopped by custom officers in Dover in South East England. He had been attempting to smuggle almost £23,000 in cash into the country. 
Although Brian was eventually let go, the money was confiscated and Brian was over £20,000 short. It's thought that this money was owed to a man called John Wilson, who was thought of as one of the big bosses. Over the next couple of years following the money seize, Brian assured John that he would pay him back the money but he just needed time. Brian decided to rent the farmhouse and start growing weed so that he could pay back the £20,000 he owed. In the early 2000s, an ounce of cannabis would have cost around £120, and after a few months of farming, the farm was bringing in around £3,000 every month. Brian did keep Burnt House Farm a secret from John, for fear that if John found out, he would likely take over the operations. Given the time it was taking, John was becoming more and more impatient. And now that Brian's children were young adults, he was trying his hardest to pay what he owed, and his main source of income was still cannabis production. Although he also worked alongside this as a market trader. As time went on, And as the plants began to grow and more needed to be harvested, it wasn't long before Brian and Mujahid needed help. Not many people knew about the operation, so Brian and Mujahid assumed it would be safe to bring on some of their most trusted family members. Mujahid brought along his stepson, Sulman Razik, and Brian brought along his children, Natalie and Gavin. In early June 2003, Brian left the family home and made his way to his car. He opened the driver's side door, got in, and made his way to Burnt House Farm. Brian didn't know it at the time, but as he left his family home in Stapley, two men were stalking his every move, watching where he was going and who he was coming into contact with. Brian pulled onto the drive and up to the side of the farmhouse. The other car held back and watched as Brian got out of his car and made his way into the main building. Brian wouldn't ever know that he had been tailed that early June morning, nor would he know that for the next eight days he was followed pretty constantly and kept a close eye on by at least three different men. On the morning of June 19th, 2003, the men who had been watching Brian made their way to Burnt House Farm. Four of these men were David Moran, James Raven, Otis Matthews, and Christopher Moore. Knowing that no one was going to be there, they ransacked the farm and loaded a number of cannabis plants and drug manufacturing equipment into a horse box ready for getaway. A little after 11.45am, Sulman pulled up to the farm and got out of his car. He approached the door and was surprised to find that it was unlocked. As he went to push on it, he was ambushed by six men, all in balaclavas and gloves. He felt someone push him hard and he fell to the floor. He then felt a number of punches before being dragged further into the farmhouse. Sulman noticed the house was messed up, with water dripping from the ceiling. He then felt some dirty leaves being forced into his mouth, and he was again dragged to another part of the farm. This time it was the cow shed. At this point, Sulman felt more kicks and punches to his body before his hands were tied up with duct tape and his ankles tied with a blue rope. One of the men threw the rope over the centre beam on the ceiling and started to pull on it so that Sulman was lifted, hanging upside down. Sulman looked around and counted that there were six men. Even if he was able to somehow get himself untied, there's no way he'd be able to escape. He was going to die. 
One of the men grabbed a barrel of muddy water and placed it under Sulman's head so that his face was completely submerged in it. Another of the men told Suman they were going to drown him. Eventually, after what felt like hours later, Suman was dropped onto the floor, but still tied up. A pillowcase was placed onto his head and he suddenly felt a burning sensation as the men poured chemicals onto his head and back. One of the men, clearly excited by this, shouted, quote, this stuff is wicked. Sulman was then dragged to sit on a chair and tied to it. He still couldn't see anything because his head was covered with a pillowcase, but he could hear the sound of flames and then felt the heat on his back and shoulders. This pain was interspersed with a staple gun being fired into his back. The attack then suddenly stopped and the pillowcase was ripped off of Sulman's head. It was sudden and unexpected. All of the men had frozen. As Sulman looked up, he noticed the men scurry towards the door of the farmhouse. That's when he heard what the other men had heard moments before. The closing of a car door and footsteps leading up to the farmhouse entrance. Within seconds, the men ran out of the building and towards the person outside. Just moments later, Sulman saw the farmhouse door open and in walked all of the men, dragging a bloody, dirty Brian Waters. Sulman realised he must have arrived for work on the farm. This is who the men had been waiting for. The men then proceeded to tie Brian up with the same blue rope and suspended him upside down from the same beam Sulman had been tied to. Two of the men then proceeded to take a garden cane and a plank of wood and beat Brian. One of the men then took out a handgun and a knife and passed them around the group. The next thing Sulman saw was Brian being dragged onto a chair which was placed next to him. He then heard the ringtone from his phone go off. One of the men pressed answer and held it to his ear. It was his mother. He spoke to her for a few moments, knowing he needed to act as normally and as calmly as possible or he'd risk more pain and torture. Once the phone call had ended, one of the other men sat a plastic bag alight and held it over Brian's naked body. This man then dripped the hot plastic over Brian, all the while the other men were asking him where the money was. At that exact moment, Brian's two children, Natalie and Gavin, had just arrived outside of the barn. Gavin noticed that the door was open and he could see water leaking from the ceiling, which he thought was strange. Just as he was considering what the cause could be, all six men, dressed still in dark clothing and their balaclavas, ran towards him and Natalie. One of the men shouted, get the fuck down, and pointed a gun towards him. Natalie was hit whilst he was punched and kicked. Both he and Natalie were dragged into the barn, where his hands were tied behind his back, and he was also tied by his neck and pulled over the beam. Natalie was tied and put in the corner of the barn. However, her face wasn't covered, so she was actually able to get a look at the men. Unfortunately, Because they were all wearing balaclavas, she could only see that one of the men had, quote, dark brown skin around the eye holes. She also noticed that one man held a combat knife and thumb screws she recognised had come from Gavin's car. Another had a gun and another had a bat. 
Over the next three hours, Natalie and Gavin were forced to watch their father being tortured. Brian was attacked with an industrial staple gun to his head and neck, as well as having acid poured onto him, and he suffered extensive burns. He was whipped and beaten and had slash wounds to his ear. His legs were then tied with rope and he was suspended upside down over a barrel of water. He suffered 24 rib fractures and a collapsed lung. He also suffered internal injuries after being sexually assaulted with an iron bar. Gavin and Natalie were forced to watch their father suffer this brutal attack and eventually take his last breath and die in front of them. The men then dragged Brian's body outside and dumped it in the milking shed. One of the men then forced Gavin to call his mother, Julie, and tell her some of his friends were coming round to pick something up. Otis and Christopher then drove to the house and pulled up in the drive. As soon as Julie opened the door, the men ambushed her and searched the house for valuables and money. As soon as they were done, they forced Julie into the boot of the car before covering her with a duvet and shutting her in. They then drove her back to the farm and left her in the boot whilst they headed inside. It was around this point, it's thought, that David Moran made an anonymous call to 999 to report the attack at the farm. David posed as a pedestrian passing by and didn't give his name nor did he stick around to witness police arrive. Outside the barn, the men still inside heard the loud drone of police sirens come into earshot, knowing that the farmhouse was a good few miles away from anywhere police would likely be heading to, they knew they had to run. All of the remaining men made a quick getaway, and just moments later, the police pulled up to the farmhouse and discovered Gavin Natalie and Sulman still tied up. They opened the boot of the car and found Julie under the duvet. They made their way to the milking shed and found Brian's corpse on the floor. Sulman had suffered horrific injuries, but he was alive. He was rushed to Withenshaw Hospital in Greater Manchester and doctors confirmed him to be in a stable condition, but with multiple, not life-threatening injuries. The true extent of Brian's injuries was revealed when post-mortem evidence from a pathologist, Dr. Alison Armour, was presented. She said that, in her opinion, the injuries sustained by the deceased man showed that he had been tortured before his death. He had suffered extensive injuries, which included bruising, abrasions, lacerations, multiple rib fractures to both sides, and many fractured in more than one place. He also had a fractured nose and sternum, bleeding on the surface of the brain, bruising to the heart sac, and injuries caused by strangulation and compression of the neck, including sharp incised injuries to the throat. A caustic substance had been dripped or poured onto his back, causing burns. Staples had been inserted through his trunk, left arm and head. He had sustained a penetrating laceration injury to the anus which had been caused by a blunt object, such as an iron bar being rammed up or thrust deeply into him with considerable force. She concluded that Brian had suffered persistent violence over a substantial period of time. It was the combination of these injuries which had caused his death. Further wounds indicated that he had been tied under the armpits and legs. Both hands were very badly battered, which could have been sustained in defensive injuries as he attempted to fend off blows. Considerable force must have been used to cause the multiple fractures to the ribs and sternum. In the minutes and hours following the attack, 
officers arrested one suspect as he attempted to steal a car. He opened the car door to find a woman inside. Her father apprehended the suspect and the police soon arrested him. A number of eyewitness accounts recited seeing a number of men run across a bridge on the M6 motorway before disappearing. Detectives soon learnt the identities of all the men involved. They soon arrested the suspected ringleader and man who had allegedly ordered the attack, John Wilson. He was the man Brian had been in £20,000 worth of debt to. Police quickly located two more men in connection with the attack, Ashley Gouchard and David Moran. Police didn't immediately realise it was David who had placed the 999 call, but soon found out he did so as he had been instructed by the ringleader John Wilson, who wasn't actually present for any of the torture and subsequent murder that had taken place. Ashley was acquitted of all charges. David Moran was charged with murder in the first instance, but it soon came to light that he would be useful as a witness for the prosecution. David had disposed of two mobile phones used that day and agreed to plead guilty to perverting the course of justice. He told the court that he worked for John Wilson and had been told to steal the cannabis plants and equipment before then being told to wait at the farm for Brian and use, quote, any means of violence to ensure they obtained the money owed. David also told the court that John Wilson had called him after the initial attack and ordered him to pick up James Raven from the farm and then call the police to report an assault. It's not clear why John ordered this instruction. As David had pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice, he was sentenced to just 21 months imprisonment. James Raven was arrested and immediately protested his innocence. It soon came to light that James had been a freelance researcher for the BBC. He was a convicted criminal and his job was to do undercover surveillance on people suspected of criminal acts for various BBC documentaries and news reports. Whilst working as a freelancer, James had worked on the BBC's McIntyre Uncovered and Crooked Britain, as well as Sleepers for Channel 4, which did involve infiltrating gangs involved in car crime, drugs and counterfeiting. When the BBC was asked to comment, they stressed that although they had known about James's past criminal convictions and violence, they considered him a reformed man and hired him particularly for the fact that he was able to fit in, in situations where professional journalists could not. Throughout his years working, especially with the BBC, James did help to convict a number of serious criminals, and a BBC spokesperson was keen to acknowledge that at the time of Brian's murder, James wasn't working for the BBC. During the trial, particular attention was focused on the fact that James had previously worked as an undercover reporter for the BBC. The spokesperson said that, in reality, James had been a covert operative who didn't take editorial decisions. Just under a year later, in 2004, 55-year-old John Wilson of Glossop, Derbyshire, and 44-year-old James Raven from Bolton were both tried at Chester Crown Court. The court heard that one of the accomplices, James's cousin Christopher Moore, had bragged about work as a surveillance journalist alongside James, and how he had been following Gavin Waters, Brian's son, for at least nine days before the murder had happened. James had described this as a, quote, reconnaissance mission. The judge did acknowledge that he didn't think the group set out to murder Brian. However, he did say, these crimes were exceptionally sadistic. The violence used was both gratuitous and extreme, 
and was characterised by humiliation and degradation of Brian Waters before he died. Before that, he had undergone extremes of physical violence. Whatever your precise intention, no man could have survived those injuries and Brian Waters did not. With its overtones of greed, sadism and torture, this was a very serious case. Both James and John Wilson, the suspected ringleader, were convicted for murder and plotting grievous bodily harm. Both men were jailed for life, with the judge recommending that they serve at least 24 years. The next person to be arrested was Otis Matthews. Otis's trial took place in the summer of 2004, but after much deliberation, the jury did not come to a decision and Otis was freed. Just a few months later, however, Otis was retried and this time convicted. He was sentenced to life in prison. The judge said that the crime committed had been, quote, an exceptionally sadistic murder committed for gain, and that Otis had shown no remorse or contrition. The judge concluded, his ordeal culminated in being forced to witness the physical abuse of his daughter and son, both of whom were trussed up within his line of vision, as was the man who had been tortured before him. All this for monetary gain. Otis was sentenced to serve 22 years before being eligible for parole. Although Otis, James, John and David had been convicted and would be serving out their sentences in prison, there was one man, James's cousin Christopher, who had been identified but not arrested. Immediately following the murder in 2003, 25-year-old Christopher had left the country. Police gained intelligence that he was hiding out in Malta or in Spain and suspected his 60-year-old father, also called Christopher, and his 51-year-old mother Eileen had aided his escape. Both Christopher Sr. and Eileen were arrested for assisting their son to escape and Christopher Sr. did admit to boarding a plane at Liverpool John Lennon Airport and flying to Malaga with a suitcase full of clothes, a mobile phone and £2,500 in cash to give to his son. He would not disclose Christopher's location. Christopher Sr. was sentenced to spend nine months in prison and ordered to pay £130,000 in costs. Following Christopher Sr. and Eileen's interrogations, Detective Inspector Paul Rumney said, I don't know at this stage whether he is still in Spain, whether he has returned to this country and is keeping a low profile, or whether he has moved on to somewhere else in the world to evade the police inquiry. If Chris Moore is watching this, sat in a bar in Spain, could I just say to him this, the Cheshire Constabulary will not close this case until you have faced court for what you have allegedly done. You have two choices. You can either give yourself up or spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder. Cheshire Police offered a £30,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of anyone else involved in the attack, with specific focus on Christopher Moore. Despite the reward and continued police interest in Christopher's whereabouts, unfortunately, 16 more years would pass with no progressive tips or information. Around this time, Police joined together to target 96 criminals from the UK, suspected to be living in Spain. Christopher was added to Europe's most wanted list in April 2019. Following this new joint operation between the National Crime Agency and Maltese authorities, a European arrest warrant had been issued, and Christopher was located and detained in northern Malta. Malta. 
Christopher was in fact extradited to the UK in March 2020, but the trial details have not yet been publicly released. Even 17 years after the horrific murder of Brian Waters and brutal attack on his employee Sulman and children Gavin and Natalie, the National Crime Agency did continue to pursue the perpetrators so that eventually justice could be properly served. 